Good evening and a warm welcome to you. Live studio audience. What a treasure that is. A warm welcome to, to our online audience as well. We haven't forgotten about you. So a hybrid feel to this evening. Brav iawn. It's the Nantgaru campus, colleague of Camoy, Jochen Bauer. Fel a gwelwch chi. I will be using Timo Bravo Gymraeg at Timo Bachus Eisneg. So can I ensure that those of you who are with us online and those have made sure that you've toggled on, that's a new verb for me, toggle on to the simultaneous translation on your devices. And the studio audience here, I know you've got your headsets. And then when I'm speaking well, she'll be able to understand me, hopefully. It's good to be here. It's a pleasure to be here with you to discuss further education in this manner. So, what will, how will uh, tonight's night uh, be the shape of it? The first half uh, will be um, Jeremy Mouse will be uh, joining us, talking about his priorities. And the second part of this evening, a very instrumental part of this evening, an opportunity for you to pose questions but for our panel to answer as well. And let's hopefully we'll get this kind of virtual dialogue happening. And I've got an esteemed panel. The minister will join the principal and chief executive of Coleg Gwent, along with a key learner from Coleg Cymoedd. And we're going to look forward very much to that. Of that Q&A session, obviously there is an opportunity for you to pose your questions during this evening's uh, event. So follow the slide co option on, on your devices at home in the box that apparently is underneath my video feed now. Make sure you can insert those questions as you listen to the minister. And also you in the audience, you've for you to submit live questions as well. Now, we have um, already received questions um, already. The invitation went out to ask um, questions on the DISC platform. We've got uh, those two. There'll be a combination of questions that we've received um, up to now, and the questions we'll receive live tonight. Well, we might not answer all of the questions this evening, but there will be responses to all questions submitted after this event. So don't worry too much if it hasn't been answered tonight. There will be an answer uh, in time. But now it's a pleasure of mine to introduce our guest, very special guest speaker this evening, the Minister for Education and Welsh Language, Jeremy Miles, MS. Thank you very much for the welcome and good evening to you all. It's such a pleasure to have the opportunity to be here in Colega Cymoedd with you here in Nanskaro to discuss the future of further education in Wales. And thank you ever so much to Colega Cymoedd, to Karen and the team um, for hosting us uh, tonight in this uh, wonderful building. And also thank you very much to all of you for giving your time, either at home or um, here with us in the audience. Since I've undertaken uh, the ministerial role for education and Welsh, I've seen through my own eyes the commitments and the contribution that the education sector makes in Wales. And it's been fantastic to see the great rel relationship between the Welsh Government and the education sector and of course that doesn't surprise me at all we've got an uh, incredible um, strong base of principles uh, that are um, that are the same for all of us that we want to see an education system in wales that ensures that each and every one of our learners um, goes from strength to strength and also um, makes our uh, communities stronger and our cultural and our civic lives um, also in the same fashion for uh, a minister perhaps to say but I do think that we've seen the fruits of uh, that relationship during the last two years and I want to thank you as a sector uh, for the way that you've responded uh, to the trials and the tests of the pandemic. Uh, you've put learners and their needs at the heart of everything that, that you've done and the support 
and care that you've shown learners and staff was exceptional. Um, you've worked well with uh, schools to recognise the particular needs of learners who have I think borne the brunt uh, of the disruption in our system quite often and that's been vital to their uh, to their ability to transition on to their next stage uh, or to keep motivated. Um, you've been incredibly agile uh, in responding to uh, the new demand for online learning for that blended uh, offer and you've really played your part in terms of the wider COVID response. Uh, for different colleges that has looked uh, different. So I know that here the facilities were made available to the NHS, others have uh, turned over facilities to become field hospitals. So whatever contribution uh, you've made, that has been uh, greatly, uh, greatly welcome. So learner focus, uh, collaboration, uh, adaptability, uh, well-being and resilience, uh, and local leadership. Uh, those five values or approaches uh, are the ones which, for me at least, you've exemplified as a sector in the last couple of years. And I think as we look forward uh, to the future, those values need to shape our common vision for further education. Um, I'm conscious that since becoming minister in the middle of uh, the COVID pandemic, there hasn't been a particularly uh, natural opportunity really to set out some of the broader uh, uh, issues that we uh, look at as a sector, some of my vision for the contribution which uh, I think the, fur the further education sector can make to the future of Wales. Um, but alongside working with you on the pandemic uh, and our response to it, we've of course been working together on what I think are the most profoundly far-reaching uh, legislative reforms to post-16 education that Wales uh, has seen in the tertiary education and research bill. And these are, you know, an essential underpinning for a post-16 sector which is uh, fit for the future. But this is not the totality uh, of our vision for further education in Wales. And so this evening I want to share with you how important the strategic partnership that we have with the sector is to me. And I'd like to deepen that relationship uh, still further. And this is a government which is committed to uh, further education. I was determined that we would reflect that in our budget settlement for this year. And so for the 2022-23 financial year, uh, you'll see investment of uh, 415 million pounds directly to colleges for core provision and support, which is the largest increase in many years. And I'm also pleased that we could take advantage of the uh, multi-annual settlement from Whitehall to provide you with visibility of budgets over the next three years. Um, and in addition to that, I'm announcing today a further £17.2 million of investment uh, to help modernise uh, learning environments in colleges across Wales. Uh, as well as funding, uh, initiatives like uh, TIFE, our new global education exchange programme, show the importance we attach to creating new opportunities in further education and vocational education. It's the most uh, generously funded international mobility programme, uh, including for further education in Wales ever, uh, with uh, £3.5 million available for applications this year. The same amount for further education as for higher education. Um, and it's tailor-made for Wales and it'll enable staff and students to spend uh, periods of uh, study or work uh, overseas. Uh, applications to the programme open tomorrow. Um, and I would really encourage uh, colleges across Wales to apply so we can make sure that those exciting opportunities uh, are available to our learners in further education uh, and staff, as I say, right across Wales. But back to those uh, five values or uh, approaches. What do they tell us about the future path? Uh, to the first of those, then, a learner focus. At, at the heart of everything that we do, is the need to ensure that our students gain the skills and qualifications they need to flourish and to progress seamlessly uh, along the range of qualifications levels uh, as we aim for uh, a single integrated uh, skill system. And that's a path that starts out perhaps for some learners as, a, as an entry level course, can lead on in the end to a vocational qualification to a degree perhaps. And that path needs to be as easily navigable and clearly marked for vocational learning as it is for the academic route. 
and we published this week our employability uh, strategy and I, I think further education uh, the sector is a critical delivery partner uh, for the ambitions of that strategy um, ensuring access to the right skills at the right time and responding quickly and flexibly uh, to labor market needs and as we have changes in the economy uh, so too do we have changes in the education system uh, whether these are reforms uh, to vocational qualifications in England, which are bound to affect us here in Wales, uh, or changes in our own school curriculum, which will reset learner expectations uh, and ambitions perhaps after 16. So we're going to need clear uh, and coherent post-16 progression pathways from the new curriculum. Um, the design of a new local curriculum beyond 16 will be a shared responsibility uh, of the government and the new commission when it's established uh, from next year after the bill becomes law. And I'm expecting to receive a report from Estyn uh, in the early summer looking at the availability um, and quality of the current curriculum offer. Um, and that will enable uh, us to take forward a broader review then of the local curriculum offer for learners between 16 uh, and 19 to support that first cohort um, of new curriculum learners entering post-16 settings in 2027. Um, and I intend then in the first statement of priorities to the new commission when it's established to set out the process uh, for changes to that local curriculum. And we are also going to need uh, access to qualifications in Wales that respond to industry need. And our programme for government uh, and the cooperation agreement with uh, Plaid Cymru sets out our shared commitment to significantly expand uh, the range of made for Wales vocational qualifications to fit the needs uh, of our learners and uh, our economy. Uh, we'll review the current offer of vocational qualifications in Wales and use the finding, findings to bring forward uh, reforms. We're working on Plaid Cymru uh, with this and we'll want to make sure uh, that no learners in Wales uh, are disadvantaged by reform driven by uh, the UK government. And colleagues, uh, our learners uh, include learners who want to learn uh, in Welsh. Um, and increasing the number of people who can learn through the medium of Welsh is a priority for us all, crucial to the success of our Cymraeg 2050 policy and to the new strategic duty in our bill to uh, expand Welsh medium uh, tertiary provision. Um, and in the cooperation agreement, we uh, commit to funding uh, the colleague Cymraeg Kenneth Lethal to increase uh, the proportion of apprenticeships uh, and further education programmes that are available uh, in Welsh in partnership uh, with you. And that's obviously uh, good news. But the task, I think, for us all uh, this evening is to see the goal of ensuring that more study in Welsh as a fundamental part of all our uh, missions here as uh, further education providers. What goals and targets will you set uh, and how will you meet them? Wales needs a confident bilingual workforce but let's be frank we also know that one of the key obstacles to that is ensuring a confident bilingual workforce in further education. Um, so I want to work with you um, as a sector to identify how we can do more uh, to ensure that the workforce is there to help us meet this ambition and so let's work together creatively to try and solve that challenge and our learners increasingly as we all know want to learn at any stage in life now we all know that not everyone is able to make the most of that chance in education the first time round in school or college so i want wales to be a nation of second chances in education a nation where it's never too late to learn where people have the confidence, the motivation, and the means to re-enter education at any stage. Uh, and the duty to promote lifelong learning is the first strategic duty in our new bill. But we know that the picture across the UK uh, is that overall participation by adults in education has fallen over the last 10 years. Um, and the less well off you are, the less likely you are to have had any training since you've left school or college. So we need to focus uh, our efforts on ensuring that learning opportunities are available to those who will benefit the most and our new bill will place a duty on the new commission uh, to secure proper facilities for further education and training for eligible adults and that's a big step forward 
uh, in adult provision, and it will be backed up by funding. And so I want to work with you uh, to define the scope of that duty in the regulations. And the next two years, I think, are going to be crucial uh, to build the capacity that we need to deliver on that uh, commitment uh, in the longer term. So to help us do that, I've set up an external reference group for adult learning with further education representation so that we can work with all parts of the tertiary sector to improve uh, quality, access and progression in skill-based, formal and informal adult learning. Looking at how we can deliver better equity and access, better collaboration, a clear curriculum framework to support progression, how we develop and support the workforce required to make that a reality. And that group meets for the first time next week, so I'm very uh, excited to get that work uh, underway. Uh, you'll have seen that although we were talking about learner focus, uh, a theme so far has been about working together. So the next of the five uh, values uh, is around collaboration. Uh, and one of the principles uh, underlying the uh, tertiary education research bill is that at a system-wide level, uh, we can do more to meet the needs uh, of learners by providers operating within a coherent, complementary uh, ecosystem. And so, crucially, uh, achieving a collaborative sector is one of the goals and duties of the new commission. But it's also true uh, that at an institutional level, uh, often the needs of learners and the economy can be best served by providers obviously working with each other and with industry and business and government and others. Uh, and we're already seeing some fantastic examples uh, of successful collaboration between further education, higher education and industry, whether that's in uh, advanced manufacturing, construction, uh, in transport and digital in management, there are a lot of potential models. And this is already showing us, I think, how we can develop new strategic pathways, better opportunities for learners, uh, and a higher skilled workforce and even access to research uh, for businesses by putting to one side uh, those conventional sectoral boundaries. Again, the bill is intended to remove some of those boundaries, but apart from that, if you have plans which need us to look again at some of the practical obstacles, my message to you is that I'm very open to uh, hearing about how we can look at that creatively. But even where the aim isn't that sort of broad strategic partnership, colleges obviously have a long track record of working with local employers to identify skills needs and uh, opportunities for their learners. And I think the task for us now is to try and build on that so that we create what I would call a habit, a strategic habit uh, of collaboration between colleges and employers, yes, but also with uh, the regional skills partnerships and government, um, which looks both at the long-term trends but also responds you know, nimbly to those more immediate needs. And if you want an example of the kind of thing I have in mind, uh, I think you can look no further than the um, personal learning accounts. I think we've been able to work together on PLA very effectively to react quickly to examples of uh, market failure, really, and, and to target funding uh, to meet employer demand, supported by um, RSP intelligence. Good examples with HGV licenses, uh, some of the shortages in health and social care. So the first of those uh, new HGV licences was actually delivered within weeks uh, of the funding being committed. So I think the challenge is to use that approach, working with employers and RSPs, to influence mainstream provision in the same way, not only where there's uh, a market failure today, but to preempt uh, market needs and employer needs uh, into the future as well. And my officials are working with uh, colleague and company to develop um, a more flexible approach within, within each uh, college's mainstream allocation to help you to uh, respond to those emerging needs but taking away some of the risks uh, for you which sometimes come with uh, new areas of delivery. Um, and the last thing I want to say in this uh, area of collaboration is about collaboration uh, between further education colleges and schools. Um, and I know colleges uh, will do all you can to support those learners who've, again, faced those particular challenges uh, in their qualifications years. You've a very strong track record of doing that with schools in a very difficult time. But I think the task uh, for us all now is to try and do more, both uh, as schools and colleges, to build on the close working that we've seen. 
and to bring the unique assets that colleges and schools have respectively together to give our learners a better sense of the world of work, uh, of vocational routes as part of their school journey, uh, and to ease the transition to post-16 uh, for all. Uh, the next principle was adaptability, and uh, we live in a world where change is the, is the only constant, uh, in truth, and you're in the middle of that Venn diagram between a changing economy and the change in educational provision, right at the heart of that, really. And how, what, and when people learn is obviously changing. Some of that we've talked about uh, already. Uh, but I want to draw out one of the uh, major changes that I think is a, is, a, is a culture change as well as a delivery change, and that's obviously around digital transformation of learning. Obviously, this isn't new territory, but what I think is new is the breadth and the depth of it um, and the expectations that learners and staff will now have. And the experience of the pandemic, I think, will only have intensified that. Uh, so the use of digital tools and technologies should obviously become a natural part of a learner's wider learning journey. And I want to see our learners equipped with the skills and the digital capabilities that they need to succeed. And over the last few years, we've been able to invest a lot in delivering uh, on the Digital 2030 uh, strategy. And during COVID, I think we've been able to more or less fully meet the demand from the sector in terms of devices and connectivity and other kit and equipment, if you like, to make sure that all learners could study remotely when they needed to in those very difficult times. So this is a good foundation, I think, for us to build on. And I also know that colleges uh, have been collaborating on some very innovative approaches, uh, such as masterclasses with guest speakers, regional teach meets, even some joint online classes in a few cases. And I'm really keen to explore how we could build on this to make uh, you know, a more coherent, modern, blended learning offer uh, right across Wales, really, so that uh, learners have access to the best pol possible quality uh, online provision. So please do bring us uh, your proposals for how we could work together to extend that. I think it would be a very interesting area for us to explore together. Our fourth princ principle is well-being uh, and resilience. And you know, over the last two years, uh, we've again been able to... Um, support uh, the sector to look after and support their uh, learners and staff in very uh, difficult times and the huge pressures I think that the pandemic has brought to bear um, or on all parts of the sector will be felt for years to come. Um, you know one of the most important things that uh, education can do is help learners uh, to become more resilient and I think the cohort of learners that you will have had uh, and you'll have been working with over the last two years uh, have had to demonstrate that and I think that is a you know a, an asset to them in their future working lives and I think it's important to acknowledge uh, acknowledge that really and I know a lot of colleges are doing a lot of innovative innovative work uh, in this area working as well with Collega Cymru uh, to support that sense of active well-being um, so we'll continue to work closely with you to make sure that the right support uh, is in place uh, I've think increased the existing funding streams for the next financial year to support uh, post-16 learner mental health uh, and well-being in particular. But I, I realise this is a long-term issue. And I realise as well uh, how vital it is both for the workforce and for the resilience of the sector more broadly for us to support uh, lecturers in their professional learning and career development. I want to see uh, lecturers and assessors with access to a rich source of professional development and able to refresh and renew uh, their sector focused skills through a network if you like of, of industry uh, engagement so over the course of the next 12 months uh, we'll be taking forward four crucial pieces of work to support the profession firstly we'll be developing a professional learning plan for uh, for further education teaching workforce which will bring together uh, a range of training, advice uh, and guidance for staff at all levels uh, to develop your careers and professional lives and my aim is to make that available uh, on Hub and that will include a, a core package uh, of CPD so that you can access the courses that you need with a focus uh, on improving digital skills uh, and we've commissioned JISC to develop a bespoke programme for you on designing and delivering blended learning. It's being piloted at the moment, 
um, and it'll be rolled out from the summer. Secondly, we'll be reviewing initial teacher education for the sector, looking at the impact and effectiveness of the current qualifications and incentives and what reforms uh, could be needed. Thirdly, this year we'll be taking forward a knowledge transfer programme, bringing expertise from key sectors into colleges to help our learners uh, learn from some of the higher skilled practitioners around. And fourth, we're also looking creatively at ways to help uh, improve workforce links with industry to ensure that teachers and assessors retain and hone uh, their professional skills and expertise. Um, I probably don't need to tell this room that a career in the post-16 uh, sector can be incredibly rewarding. Uh, so we want to raise the profile uh, of post-16 uh, teaching and highlight the opportunities. Um, and later this month, we'll be launching uh, a major recruitment campaign to raise awareness uh, and promote uh, the profession. And finally, the last of those uh, five uh, values and approaches, uh, local leadership. Uh, we've seen so clearly, I think, in the last two years, the importance of place uh, in the well-being uh, and the economic health uh, of people um, and the role of colleges as anchor institutions in their communities and their local economies has always been important, uh, but will become increasingly important. You have a phenomenal reach through your physical assets, through your workforce, uh, through your procurement capacity, your skills development, your network of business and industry contacts, and your institutional leadership roles, which can make a really significant impact uh, in most local areas. Um, and in 2017, uh, a colleague I can report, as many of you will know, suggested that the economic impact of uh, FE colleges uh, in Wales to the local business community was around four billion a year. And I think since then, uh, we've seen a surge, I would say, in interest in uh, the importance of strengthening local economies, be that through the foundational economy, through the role of town centre transformation, jobs closer to home initiatives, as well as the new working patterns we've seen during COVID, which I think underscore both the potential and the responsibility of colleges to seek to contribute uh, as much as possible to local opportunity uh, and prosperity. Uh, so I've asked my officials to do a piece of work with Collegae Cymru to develop a current understanding of the wider economic impact of the college sector in Wales and how we can work together to support the work of colleges as anchor institutions in your local economies. And also, um, as we realise together the new focus on civic mission, which will be a sector-wide priority uh, when our bill becomes law. Colleagues, in closing, we are living in times of great change and challenge, whether it be the pandemic, the response to Brexit, uh, climate change, uh, automation and technological transformation, demographic trends. Uh, any one of those would be a big enough challenge in most generations, and we are facing them all at once. But we are facing them together. Um, and the further education sector in Wales exemplifies that practical entrepreneurial instinct that we all need in order to recognize that in the midst of all these challenges, there are also opportunities. If we are adaptable, collaborative, if we focus on our resilience, on leading in our communities, and if we put the needs of the learner at the heart of all that we do. I am excited about the opportunity that we have as a sector in the years ahead, and I look forward to working with you all to make the most of it. Diolch mawr. Thank you very much for that. Um, challenges and opportunities, yes, well, now is the challenge of giving you the opportunity to pose the questions. But as you can see, I've got my delighted guests with me, and I'd like them to introduce themselves to you. So we won't get the minister to reintroduce himself. Please introduce yourself, Rosie. Um, I'm Rosie Adams, and I'm currently doing childcare level three in this college, actually, Nankaro. So you're at home here this evening, so you're yeah. probably feeling more comfortable at home than any of the rest of us. <laughs> Lovely yeah. to have you with us, Rosie. Diolch and Guy. Good evening. Uh, I'm Guy Lacey. 
I'm the Principal and Chief Exec of uh, Colour Gwent, uh, which is my day job, but also I'm the current Chair of Colour Guy Cymru. Which we heard a lot about in the Minister's speech just now. Well, it's over to the questions and here we go. The first question, I hope my eyes don't let me down. Okay, a long question and it's posed by David Evans, Chief Executive Officer, Group Llandrithlon Menai. The financial support given to support learners' well-being, <coughs> mental health and loss of curriculum has been invaluable this year. However, the legacy of COVID is likely to be with us for several years in Take of Learners. Can we be assured that some COVID support funding will be forthcoming for the next few academic years? Obviously, we heard about some funding initiatives. Is that part and parcel of this, Minister? We'll start with you. Yes, I mean, I think over the last couple of years, it's probably been around £140 million pounds or so that, uh, in terms of COVID support for the sector, um, more or less. Um, and as colleagues will know, um, from this financial year onwards, that um, dedicated source of funding coming through the Barnet formula from Westminster is actually not available. Um, but as I was saying in, in my speech, you know, the effects clearly don't end on the 31st um, of this month. So um, there will be funding available and for the next financial year, I think it's around um, £24 million, pounds, more or less, um, just, just under that. And some of that is aimed up specifically for the kind of well-being um, points that, um, that uh, David was asking about in his question. Um, and today we've published the uh, Renew and Reform for Post-16 um, strategy for the future. And that really is about understanding with uh, colleagues what has worked well, evaluating it, and making sure that those interventions become the ones which are kind of, you know, more available into the future and the funding will be allocated on that basis. Rosie, I have to ask you this question. What support do you feel you've had from your college during this such difficult period and the difficulty of coming back into college now? We've had a lot of support recently to do with the past few years, actually. We've been given the opportunity to have and taken home a laptop so for online working because most students haven't got a laptop or a device in the house that they could possibly use to do all that. So the college has funded everyone with, if needed, for laptops and that's really helped us throughout everything. And they've provided masks and, and, and like a later full old test as well for all the students as well just to take whenever they did, whenever whenever the day feel is right. The support from college since COVID happened has been really helpful for a lot of students. And if we needed somewhere to go talk about it, uh, we have those places that we can go and feel comfortable with. That's really important, mm. the practical resource-led support, but also that well-being support that is part and parcel of that question. From your point of view, and, and your uh, colleague at Gwent, for instance, you know, how has it been for you, and how is that transition happening now? Um, well, to, you know, it has been pretty awful. I mean, I think that's, that's the thing we do have to recognise, the impact on staff and learners over the course of the last two years, three academic years, has been, has been mm. really profound. Um, I think David's question is interesting. I think um, in, in the question he is highlighting that support has, that we've received from Welsh Government has been invaluable. And um, the Minister knows this, you know, the sector is extremely grateful to the way in which Welsh Government has supported us as a sector. Um, and I, I think it goes beyond the scope of David's question, since it's not just been that financial support. I think what the sector has valued is the way in which officials have worked with us in a spirit of real partnership. Um, I think, you know, moving forward, uh, David is right to point out that the, the legacy of the pandemic, mm. assuming for the moment that yeah. you know, the 28th of March is a, a milestone, which we sincerely hope it is, uh, the legacy of the pandemic is going to be with us for many years. Mm. Um, and you know, certainly we are going to see children coming to further education from schools who have missed significant elements of learning, um, whose confidence and resilience has been impacted. Um, and I think that, for me, um, I think the important thing is to hear reassurance uh, from the Minister and from Welsh Government that, that that collaborative approach to dealing with this is going to continue because I think you know, we, should, we should actually um, celebrate the fact that the, the, the sector as a whole has been very resilient in its mm. response. 
Yeah, lessons learned and not forgotten. Yeah. You know, okay, Jochen Bauer. Oh, now there's a question there on learner voice and the font size. Ah, oh, that is much better. <laughs> Could you feel the panic? <laughs> Uh, right, I was going to put my glasses on. Learn a voice, so I know who's going to answer this one first. Okay, the question is, and it's asked by Jeremy Harvey from NUS Wales. How will you be doing more to embed student voice in the Terrible, in light of the recommendations uh, from the Children, Young People and Education Committee? Before I get to answer that directly, that specific question, learn a voice, Rosie, I have to start this one with you. How much opportunity do you get or have you had to have your voice heard at college? So part of, of being part of the Learner Voice actually, we do have six meetings per year, roughly about that. And it's just about an hour, two hours long normally. And we go in there and then we'll just speak about how we could make the college better for not just us, but everyone else, staff and all the learners, even the new visitors that we have come in. Uh, and we, every time we, I make sure that everyone's feeling in, like that they can be a part of this, like no matter who they are or like what they believe in, it's comfortable for them to come in. And then we'll have meetings saying how, how we can make the cards better. And then we'll just hopefully get that heard from higher people, obviously, and making sure that it comes into our college. Great. Such a crucial element. I'm, I'm more familiar with, with the schools, obviously, but then it's such an important element. And it's interesting that you mentioned that you give your opinion on, on not just the learner him or herself, but on staff and different elements associated with college life. Dear Rosie, but back to the question. I have to start with the minister again. So your response to that particular question, minister. Well, I mean, I, I think how important learner voice is just exem exem exemplified by what Rosie was saying and actually what Guy was saying about, you know, the challenges of the last two years. You know, we have to make sure that learners are at the heart of everything we do. That's our common mission. Um, and giving voice to learners in these reforms has been important. We've worked closely with uh, NUS and other organisations to make sure that uh, the bill reflects that. Um, so at the heart of the bill is this idea um, of the learner engagement code, but also of representation at a board level in the new commission itself. Um, and there's been, you know, during, during the passage of the, the scrutiny of the bills, rather, so far, there have been some debates around what more could be done, really, to, to bring it even further to the fore. So um, they've been in kind of two areas, really. One is what can more can you do in the board area? And I'm clear that what the provisions in the bill are sort of minimum requirement, really. And I think there's probably room for me as minister to, you know, clarify my expectations in terms of the, you know, kind of accompanying the memorandums that, that go with the bill and so on. But in terms of the bill itself, um, I do think that uh, in terms of the strategic duties which the Commission is intended to reflect in its work, there probably is more we can do to put the idea of learner voice more clearly uh, on the face of the bill in that part of it. So uh, I am working on uh, what some amendments could look, to, look like to reflect what we've heard from the NUS and others during the scrutiny of the bill. And your perspective on that, Guy, why is Learner Voice so important and why should it be taken care of? Um, learner Voice is, is critical to, um, to understanding how colleges can improve. So I think, for me, Learner Voice needs to, be a, 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 needs to be systematic throughout your institution. So Rosie's talked about that sort of layer of, um, of, of student voice course representatives, student council, all those sort of mechanisms, which I know that all of my colleagues will routinely have within their colleges. But it, it's, a, it's a ladder which stretches then up to things like board representation, mm. student governors playing an important part in decision making. Um, and I think the really good examples which you see across the sector are when you start to get things like learner voice being included in things like procurement decisions. Mm. And I mean, the, the, it, our colleges are here for our learners. So if we don't listen to our learners, then, then that is a fundamental failing. So learner voice is absolutely critical. Yeah, it, it empowers the learners. It gives them that yeah. added sense of maturity. I've been in situations when I've heard students you know, appointing head teachers or lecturers or whatever, and they really feel part and parcel of the organisation mm. by having that opportunity, don't they? Great, Jochen Right, independent advice. 
Oh, there are two questions here. Okay, question asked by Mark Dacey, principal of Neath Talbot College, and a question asked by Mark Jones, principal of Gower College. Let's read the two. I feel I'm doing story time here. <laughs> Hope you don't fall asleep. Okay, how can we make sure that school pupils receive independent advice on all options that are available to them post-16? And the next question, when you were deciding where to study, was the advice and guidance you received fair and equitable? And what advice would you give uh, to Year 11 pupils and indeed all institutions in terms of ensuring the appropriate advice and guidance is fair and equitable? Now, I'm not going to translate that, but, but anyway, two parts of the question. This time, I think it's about time I gave Guy the first opportunity to answer. <laughs> so, is it about you giving year 11 pupils advice or what were you like at year 11, Guy? Oh, no, I don't, but I don't, I don't basically, you know 11. where the questions are steering us. Yeah, that yeah. independent advice, which is probably holistic in its approach, I think that's what the questioners are getting at. Yeah, I, d I think both these questions are getting at, s at some of the sort of fundamental issues we face around um, how children make decisions when they leave school, um, how do they make decisions about progression. And I think there's an awful lot tied up in this. Um, there's an awful lot of um, uh, society's wider attitudes towards different types of study. Um, I think we have some very, very good examples in Wales of where we've been able to create um, some fairly big steps forward towards parity of esteem so that young people can choose a vocational provision, can choose apprenticeships, um, or indeed can choose traditional routes through things like A-levels. Um, but I think we also have to recognise, as I think both questioners are pointing out, that sadly there are examples of where children are in school and do not have access to that impartial advice and guidance. Um, and I think that does lead, um, on some occasions, to children receiving poor advice and guidance and making poor decisions. Um, clearly, there's a, you know, colleges have got a role in promoting their courses and providing advice and guidance. And I think um, I would say that our sector actually is good about dealing with young people who come to us and providing advice, which is um, open to all of the possible options that a young person might want to pursue. Um, but I think you know we, we have to work in, in partnership with organisations like Careers Wales. Um, but I think that uh, you know, we do have to recognise that this is, is, is not currently available universally to all children in schools. Well, I mean, two things. I actually don't think I had any um, independent advice uh, when I was making my uh, decisions. I think it was much more along the lines of when deciding what A-levels to do, what O-levels are you good at? And it just didn't get really much beyond that. Um, and I just want to say there's a lot of work going on at the moment to respond to this year's 11 years challenges between FE and Careers Wales to support those learners to make the right choices for them. So I think that's fantastic. Um, but, you know, you, we cannot have a situation where there's a sort of predetermined set of options for students, pupils going through school. Um, that should be the widest possible range of options reflecting the particular preferences and talents of any individual student. That's the test, not what happens to be provided here or there. So, that, you know, the, the starting point is what works for this student. Um, and I think, you know, as I was saying in my speech, really, I think we need to make sure that schools are providing opportunities for that vocational option to be, you know, discussed and available and understood, really, um, throughout um, throughout uh, the learner's journey and the, and the other options that are available, by the way, as well. Um, so there's a... I mentioned the Estin report um, that I'm expecting in the summer um, that will also um, uh, describe the kind of advice that people are getting as they go through school. So I think it'll tell us some useful things about how we can make sure that that level of advice, you know, that the best, you know, when it's at its best, is really great, is available to all students in the way that Guy was saying. But, you know, there's been, actually, I think it's probably a year now since, um, again, it was an interesting piece of work around work, you know, partnership working between schools and colleges, and there has been a sort of process underway to improve that, and I think that is bearing fruit. But on the specific question, we'll be finding out more in the summer, and I think we'll... Um, have some clear guidance from that about how best to move it forward. What advice did you get, Rosie? Well, what are you getting at the moment to further your career? At the moment, I am getting advice for, for the stuff I want to do in the future. 
I'm getting that help from carers, no, from carers away as I am. Good. So they're helping me with that. But from when I was in year 11, actually, I didn't get as much as advice as I wanted to because when I was moving from year 11 to college areas, COVID had just hit. So we wasn't allowed, like, one-to-ones with people anymore and we wasn't allowed mm. to see them face-to-face. -face, so it was all just confusing. Moving into college, I did struggle getting in, really, because I, I didn't understand what I was doing. But I had friends who had really done it all before who had helped me. But with the... <laughs> With the, the, with, the, with the teacher situation, I wouldn't get much support there because we wasn't allowed to go into school, really, and I had finished five months too early, meaning I didn't have to talk to anything as we didn't expect it coming. It was just all of a sudden, you know, it was just in our faces, really. It was just trying to get it all on our own, getting it involved and getting ourselves into college on our own accords. And it was just a bit of... Hectic situation back then. Mm. Yes, it's interesting. We think of a gap in the learning and the development of the individual, but maybe obviously it's affected every facet of your development and opportunities. And similar to you, I don't think I had any advice myself. I did consider studying law or becoming a teacher. I never did any of them. So it's all about options, the right option for the right individual, isn't it? Diochen Vaur. Let's see. Oh, a question on qualifications. And a question asked by Geraint Evans, Chair of Cardiff and Vale College, who is actually in the room tonight, but you're not allowed to answer back, Geraint Evans. <laughs> so, Minister, uh, in light of the demise in England of BTEX, and that impending withdrawal from the Welsh qualifications marketplace within the next 24 months, what steps are you and your officials taking to make sure the circa 10,000 level three vocational students sitting BTEX have a meaningful replacement by 2024? But I do hope Geraint Evers was listening careful to, carefully to your address because you touched on it. So would you like to expand on that? I'm glad you're reading these out. I feel at a disadvantage having left my glasses upstairs, but uh, thank you for that. Uh, well. So, so the, uh, the, the, the BTEC position is that in Wales they will be available till 2026. So that's the kind of period of time that we are looking for, looking at. They've been extended for uh, that period to provide, obviously, a little bit more uh, time to respond to what is, you know, the, the new landscape. So the question is, what, you know, what is the effect of what's happening in England, really? Uh, at this point in time, it isn't entirely clear what's happening in England, I would say. Um, you know, clearly the, the new Secretary of State has come in and I, I think it's pretty clear takes a slightly different view than his predecessor. Um, and the timescales are obviously being um, uh, slowed down to some extent. Uh, we don't yet have a very clear picture of what that means in practice. Um, and the 2026 period gives us a little bit more time. However, uh, clearly, we don't want to be in a position where learners are being disadvantaged because of decisions made elsewhere. So there are two things. Obviously, you will know that QW is doing its own review of the vocational qualification landscape, obviously. And you heard me talk about the, the Made in Wales, Made for Wales um, uh, policy that Jack Clyde Company and the Welsh Government together have as a priority. So uh, what I want to make sure happens in the coming months as the picture becomes clearer about what the implications are exactly of what's happening in England is that there needs to be close working between Qualifications Wales and colleges directly so that the implications of those are understood and can be responded to through the work that we'll be doing with Plaid Cymru and the work that Qualifications Wales will be doing in terms of their own reviews. Kai, would you like to in on that one as well? Yeah, I, d I, d I think there's, there is a significant challenge here. Um, you, you know, this is... Um, this has been on the cards some time now. It goes right back to the Sainsbury Review. And um, I think, um, uh, frankly, you know, if, if the minister was in a, in a room in front of an audience of my colleagues from English FE, you'd be looking at colleagues who feel a lot less supported and a lot more, lot more um, downbeat than the Welsh sector feels. Um, but the Sainsbury Review flagged up a, a, um, a political direction of travel that was all about rationalising and removing large swathes of... of valued vocational qualifications that have been available um, across the, the three nations. Um, I, think, I think the real challenge for us is that we risk losing some key vocational awards which have huge mm. respect 
amongst businesses um, that are widely recognised by the higher education sector so that young people like Rosie can choose um, vocational qualifications which are strong preparations for the world of work but equally keep their options open if they wish to pr progress to higher education. Um, and in a relatively short space of time, we're going to see, probably going to see, and I mean, I accept it's not a done deal yet, but probably are going to see the vast majority of that being s swept away um, in a way that rests completely outside of our control as a devolved nation. You know, these are decisions being made outside of our control. Um, and it is, I think, putting us into the position where, where we're having to be reactive to decisions that are being made elsewhere. That doesn't feel comfortable, I have to say. That doesn't, that doesn't feel like uh, us being, as, a, as a, a Welsh sector, us being in a position where we can strongly control our own decisions and our own destiny. So uh, I'm not sure I've got, I've got the answers, but all I know is, uh, you know, we face a real, really significant challenge. I think we, we do need to think about Made in Wales qualifications. I think that might be part of the, um, of the equation. Um, but I suspect we're going to have to be uh, more creative than that. Because whatever we do, they have got to be qualifications which allow children and young people to do those two things. Mm -hmm. Progress to work with a highly respected qualification that employers want or pr progress to higher education in a way that universities across the UK will recognise. And over to our last question and I think it's, it, it's apt that we come to this uh, having listened to your response there. How will the Minister ensure the unique contribution of FE is not overshadowed by universities under the new PSET system? Well, I'm often asked by universities how their contribution isn't going to be overshadowed by FE. So I think that <laughs> probably suggests that, you know, uh, that the approach which we're taking in the bill reflects the principles, you know, which the Hazel Corn Review, which is now, you know, seven years or something since that was commissioned. So we've been discussing this together for some time, I think. Um, and I think uh, that it's clear that the principles in the bill uh, are about the provision rather than the provider and the learners at the heart of it. And it takes away those boundaries, which I think are currently obstacles to collaboration, and brings in a transparent mechanism for funding across, you know, one sector with a diversity of providers. And it will allow all participants in that sector to have a voice in how those funding strategies are designed. And I think that gives the kind of transparency um, and open dealing, which should give confidence to all parts of the sector uh, that it's in our common interest to see these reforms succeed, as I'm sure they will. And I'd like to go back to you then, when we were talking about those qualifications, how did you choose your, your route and what, did, what are you getting from it now? Because I think it's important that we hear that. So childcare has always been my option. Since I started school, it's always been childcare, it's what I wanted to do. But getting there, I've had to do different types of courses and classes and all that, just to get involved with being in college and get the qualifications that I need. But mostly, Coming into college, doing the childcare sector, it's made, me, it's made me more involved with everything that I know what's going on, how I'm going to do it in the future, and what I need to do to get to the universities that will get me that job in that sector that I need to be in. So it's not stopping at college, it's that progression again, yeah. going from one institution to the other one. And that's why it was, I knew that, but I wanted to, Rosie to tell you about it, to, that that progression, that route is there. And again, we're being learner focused and you're having that opportunity to do so. Well, we are coming to the end of this. We could have carried on for another hour, couldn't we? But I really think it's important that we've had a, a good discussion this evening. What I really want to do is thank the panel. Um, You've been honest and coherent. That word coherency came up a lot earlier on. I really value that. And it's allowed us, I think, to have a different perspective on what's going around, behind, uh, around us uh, at the moment. Um, this dialogue obviously couldn't have happened without you in the room and you at home or on your devices, wherever you are. You might be in your cars, I don't know. But the questions that have been coming in have been valuable to create a dialogue. 
so we can continue this conversation. It's, a, it's not a, 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 it ends here. It's about continuation of that dialogue. And we will and Gwerth. And I truly appreciate the contributions that you've all made. Happen tonight. And I'm going to take the three uh, topics away with me. Aired this evening, and we've had examples from the three of you, plus their, their importance have been in the questions that we've received as well. Now, for those of you who have been uh, listening attentively or may have missed one or two aspects of tonight, uh, the, this stream obviously is available for you to watch on your devices at a later date, especially Covio. So remember, the service is available for you. Also, only do these events and improve on them by giving your feedback. It's important to reflect on everything. Bethany, go on that landing page on the invitation and there is an evaluation form there for you to give your feedback on tonight's event. On, I'm now. But for now, from us all here, in the campus in Nanskaro, in uh, Colega Kamai. Thank you ever so much.